Lloyd, how you doing today? Doing great. Great to be here. Thank you very much for coming on the Life After Business podcast. So Life After Business is kind of fascinating because uh, when you've spent your whole life trying to build a business, just the idea of there being life after business is kind of a startling thought. At least it certainly was for me. So, well, uh, elaborate on that, would you? Because, um, and I think while you elaborate, explain to the listeners a little bit of your background too, um, because you were a very successful business owner yourself. And so how did you kind of come to this epiphany? Well, you know, I always grew up with this mental model. I'm not sure where I got it from, but the mental model was that you do the best you can in in school so you can get into the best university, so that you can get the best job, so that you can start the best company, so that you can make the most money, so that you can retire as soon as the earliest <laughs> possible. And what on earth you would do after that, it never crossed my mind. And so really I was, in a sense, pursuing the American dream with no sense of really where it was going to take me. What was the what was the ultimate destination other than just checking off these boxes. So, you know, along the way, I think many of us start to wonder, is there more to life than just this? Should I keep this company? Is it a great platform? Who am I outside of this company? I bought my first piece of land when I was 14. I've always loved real estate. Yeah, my dad became my first banker and, you know, <laughs> how did you find, how'd you find that piece of land? 14 well, years old. You know, we, I grew up in Philadelphia. We went to the Jersey Shore in the summer, um, and one day on the way home from the shore, he said to my mom, you know, I don't think our kids are going to be able to afford land at the beach. It's going up in value, and it's just going to become unaffordable. And for some reason, sitting in the back of the car, I, I just couldn't get out of my mind, well, why would you wait for prices to go <laughs> And so, you know, I couldn't sleep that night. And the next day I mustered my courage and I said to him, Dad, if you'd lend me some money, I've got my own money and I'd love to go down and buy a piece of land if I could somewhere near the shore. Wow. And uh, he kind of looked at me and said, you know, Lloyd, why don't you just be normal? <laughs> 14 years old. Be 14. Go ride your bike, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Go play football. Uh, but he took me down there a few weekends later and I found, you know, five acres of basically tick infested uh, pine barren in South Jersey. But it got me hooked on this idea that you can create wealth and you can take risks and you can see opportunities. And, oh. and then it just took off from there to, you know, I went to McGill University in Montreal and got a wonderful education and I bought an orchard and started developing. A, the first project was a subdivision, you know, and, we were just married. I was 21, 22 or something like that. And we just leveraged everything we could could possibly think of to try to find, you know, the money to buy this orchard and start the process. But it got me addicted to this idea that you can just build whatever you set your mind to. But not a lot of thought about where that would really take you. I was just say, so all of, you know, the, the typical advice that it sounds like we've all heard, which is grow, get bigger, you know, it's the addicted to growth uh, mentality of owners of the American dream, like you said. I mean, did you ever get any advice about what's after that? You know, no, I, I saw some great models and that was very helpful. I saw some models of people that were, you know, 15 years ahead of me that were successful in their business, but had a broader perspective on life than just running up the score and growing their net worth. And that forced me to stop and think a little bit about um, what I was really doing. And then when I got to about 30, I took a trip through Asia. And my uh, a partner and I went to Hong Kong and stayed in a nice hotel downtown and sightseed. And then we went to Manila and we visited a, a uh, mission missionary uh, friend of ours who was working with really really poor kids in a what they call a squatters village there and I spent a week just playing basketball with these kids encouraging them you know sharing some faith stuff with them and and then I went from there to Malaysia to a five-star resort and and sitting there on the beach I realized you know 
I had more fun last week with those kids playing basketball than I'm having sitting here on this boring, you know, beach with a bunch <laughs> of other wealthy people. And I just decided that's not what I wanted. Wow, you're pretty young to have that epiphany. Well, I think maybe just the stark contrast between those countries of the wealth of downtown Hong Kong and then the poverty of a squatter's village in Manila and really having the time, the quiet time then to think. So for somebody that's in their 30s or 40s that's been really laser focused on accumulating wealth or moving up a corporate food chain, you know, I would stop and ask some long term questions and try to get clear on what you really want at the end of the day. And what would be your best question you would ask? Well, you know, I always feel like metrics are so important. You and I wouldn't build a business without very clearly defined metrics. But how many of us have very clearly defined metrics for the long view of our life, right? Right. Stuff that's we intangible some, too. Exactly. Yeah. So we've got some goals for next year. I want to be in this kind of shape and we have ways of measuring that. I want to generate this much income or I want to have this much wealth. Uh, I want to Mar I want to be married or I want to have kids or I want this car. We have some goals like that. But the question I would ask is if my life turned out perfectly, what would the elements be? And that's a metrics question. Now, the metrics doesn't mean they're all numeric. So you have to delineate between what you want to measure and how you would measure it. So... I have six metrics for my life. I've had them for the last 17 years. I carry them in my wallet and they really have been the plumb line for my life and very important for, you know, kids, people, kids our age, which are, th our kids are 30, 28, 27, 20, 25, for them to have some long-term metrics in their life. Otherwise, when an opportunity comes along, if you don't know what your long-term metrics are, how do you know whether this is taking you there or not? So where were you when you created yours and how did you land on six? Was that all you thought of or was there an actual framework that you put into place or how, how did that go? Well, back to this trip I took, it startled me into realizing there's more to life than just growing your net worth and that, you know, six or 7% of the world's population live in North America. And when you've been born here, you, you just drew the lucky gene pool, right? So uh, that there, were, there was a lot of pain and suffering in this world. And actually, I'd find more joy and fulfillment if I used my time and talent to not just acquire more, but to make an impact in people's lives in this world. So that was the first thing that changed my frame of reference about what really mattered in life. That combined with my faith and kind of learning a bit more about who God is and, and uh, leaning into that. And I know not everybody's coming from a faith perspective, but for me, that was an important piece. And then, uh, so then I met my mentor, Bob Buford, who wrote the book Halftime. And he's the one that asked me that question. He said to me, Lloyd, you know, you trundle here into my office with these goals every year, but you've never told me where you want them to take you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good question. <laughs> Some of the best things in life are just a really simple, profound question. Like How'd you that. answer them? I said, I really have no idea. And he said, so I want you to take this summer and, you know, any time that you're not, well, you got free, that you're not focused on family or business or whatever, I want you to just work on this question. If your life turned out perfectly, what would the elements or what would the components be? And um, so I did... I wrote pages and I distilled it down to one page and then I distilled it down to those to the six metrics that I have now. And that was a very important piece. So, you know, if life has two halves, the first half is really about um, making a living. And the second half has the potential to be about making a life. And the the making a living piece, the success oriented piece is important because it's in the rubrics, it's in the, the, the pressures and the construct of pursuing success that you and I learn what we're good at, how to accomplish things, leadership skills, emotional intelligence. I was listening to an interview of Bill and Melinda Gates with um, Warren Buffett 
on the Charlie Rose um, show. And she said that the reason Bill is able to make the contribution he is making in the second half in terms of human health and wellness is because he spent 30 years at Microsoft learning to be a great leader and a great thinker. That's it. It's so important too. Cause I mean, you could have all those wants and all those ambitions, but he's now launched himself with it and has the ability to do that. And, you know, I think, um, from one of our previous conversations, you and I were talking about is there's a lot of the, I, I believe that a lot of owners have paralysis of you, you, you mean, you found your six things and you even wrote a book called from success to significance, you know, uh, tailing off of, um, of Bob's book. And I, how is the what's the practical way to go about doing this is there a is there a way to find those six things because i think it's a combination of finding what you're good at like you said with with bill and with yourself and then also where can you apply that so that, like it's that, that's a lot of stuff when as an entrepreneur you're very just good at driving that number up yeah well if you own a business and you really sense that there's more to life than just driving the next quarter's earnings then First of all, you've got to do what I just said and get clear on what you really want in the long term. And then when it comes to figuring out your contribution and how the company fits in or doesn't fit in, I think of it in, in three circles that create like a Venn diagram. The first one is just to get clear. And the second is to get free and then get going. Get clear, get free, and get going. So you've got to get clear on who you are and what you're good at, what you're passionate about, what your calling is or your mission or purpose statement in life, and then get free. You know, so often your life is cluttered with stuff, with with uh, roles that you're playing at work that aren't that productive that you could easily or should easily hand off to someone else. Um hobbies that are good but not that fulfilling, friendships that might be draining, time commitments that involve running kids here and there without the thought about, is this actually contributing to this kid's health and wellness? Am I getting good quality time as a parent with this kid? Or am I just a taxi? Is it actually creating you know, a child-centered family that's not healthy? It should be a marriage-centered family. Those kinds of getting your life decluttered and then get going. In other words, figure out the context in which you can make your best contribution. What organization, what organizations, maybe it's a portfolio of organizations and what's my role? So in my life, I am, uh, I'm a thought leader. That's my strength. If you were to look at my strengths finder, uh, talent themes, uh, they are strategist, futurist, activator, belief, and focus. Love it. Now, 90% of those are in the future. So 90% <laughs> of my thinking is in the future. It doesn't make me a good operator. So when I would turn my, one of our retirement homes, we, we, we my partner and I built retirement homes. So it, every time I would turn one of our retirement homes over to my business partner to manage, the profit went up. <laughs> oh, isn't that ironic to a futurist building retirement homes? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, I could kind of visualize what could be when I'd see a property. And I listened well to lots of little old ladies and little old men, grandpas and grandpas, grandpas and grandmas. And, and so I was able to think through what would be, you know, pro properties that would really be a value to them. So if you're a, a thought leader, then you don't take organizational roles in, in, you don't take operational roles in an organization. You stay where thought is forming. Now, I'm passionate about helping high capacity business leaders find more meaning and fulfillment in their second half. So, you know, I spent six months when I first started to figure this out, I just took every opportunity that came my way. So I spent six months mentoring prisoners in no a kidding. federal penitentiary. Really? Every Thursday afternoon, I just took time off work, drove to the penitentiary and I go through the security clank, clank, you know, <laughs> and leave Crazy. my stuff in a, a lot of locker and I'd sit down with these guys and I'd just try to inspire them and encourage them. Well, it turns out I was terrible at it. <laughs> How come? It was, well, it was a bad day in prison when I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have empathy. I'd never been where they were. You know, one day I, I drove away from there and I realized, you know, um, actually I said to myself, Ryan, I said, who do you think you are? You come in here 
you give these young guys a whole bunch of smart aleck answers, and your mom was not a prostitute. Your dad never punched you in the face. No one ever shot at you on the way to school. Like, who do you think you are? You have no idea what they've been through. So, but when I sit down with a CEO at the Halftime Institute, or when I write a book, like From Success to Significance, I'm writing out of my own experience. I relate to them. So that's the core piece. Get clear on who you are at the core. Now, how did I create capacity? Well, capacity's got kind of three pieces to it. Time, money, and emotional or spiritual overflow. So I had to figure out how to get rid of lots of things I was doing with my time that were good but not best. And I had to figure out basically how to set limits on my lifestyle so I'd be free. You know, if you don't decide how much is enough, you will never have freedom to, to help anybody else. Well, so that is, I think, one of the biggest you know, challenges that owners have and entrepreneurs, right? Because, I mean, you, you build this beautiful prison, right? I mean, because it everything you do and every time you say yes you're driving up the quarterly earnings but you're not driving more emotional freedom right and so what was so what are some of the things that you did in order to to take a step back and to hand it off to your business partner i mean is there any practical things that you did that allowed you to do that whether it was commit uh, committing to the days at the prison or what were some of the things yeah well the, the interesting thing is when you get really clear on what your purpose is on this planet and what your strengths are, it helps you create capacity. You can see roles like, for example, operating some of these retirement homes where it's not a good fit. Mm -hmm. So I just simply turned that over to him and then I paid him a percentage of the gross revenue to manage the buildings and I got my time back. So, but in order to be able to do that, I needed to have decided what I really valued in terms of lifestyle. And I don't care what your wealth is, your lifestyle can always creep up to dominate your life. <laughs> yeah. So there's a few questions to ask yourself, I think. One is, is a yes or no. And that is, is there any limit to what I'll spend on myself? And you can't duck that question because even if you don't answer, you've just answered. Yeah, interesting. So we decided for our family, that it was in our family's best interest to decide that there would be a limit to what we would spend on ourselves, that hmm. we didn't think we could even build really healthy, thriving kids and grandkids if we didn't decide that there would be a limit uh, to what we spend on ourselves. Then the second question is, if, if there is, what is it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we answered that back um, in 1993, we decided we were going to limit our family spending so that we would be free to pursue things we thought would bring more joy to our family than just, you know, more toys and more cars and more houses, etc. cetera. So uh, then the third is, what is in my kid's best interest to inherit when I pass away? And you can, if you want overwhelming evidence, read the stories of how many kids' lives have been ruined by being overendowed by a well-intended, wealthy mom and dad that just gave them too much money when they passed yep. away. What did Warren Buffett call? He calls them a uh, trust fund food stamps or something like that, because <laughs> they're not <laughs> actually producing economic value. <laughs> yeah, and break it down to the practicality of it, right? Yes, yeah, so you rob. Our, we can rob our kids from the joy of accomplishment or whatever. So. If you think about this way, if you decide, yes, there's a limit to how much you spend on yourself, and you decide what that limit is, and you decide what the amount that's in your kid's best interest to inherit when you die, now you're given, now you're left with freedom. Yep. Now you've got capacity. So, which is interesting too, because I think there's a lot of people I know that are scared of that capacity because they haven't answered the first question, right? Of like who they are and what do they actually want from life? So they haven't created those metrics that you've given, but let, let's say that they have done both of those things, right? And so they're, they're moving in the right direction. They've kind of a, a, attacked two of those circles of the Venn diagram and they're starting to create this margin, right? And they're, they're whether it's freedom from roles or the stuff for hobbies. Um, you said that you just started saying yes to a lot of things. Um, and there's a couple of questions I have because, you know, where, how do you start filling that margin? And like, what are the different trials and errors that you, that you went through and that uh, you can see other people doing? And then 
how do you know what's right for you as you're going down that path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the third circle is context. So core, get clear on who you are, capacity, declutter your life, and then try to figure out what context you make your best contribution. Chances are if you own a business and you've run a business and you've been successful at it, the business may, may be an important platform for you, an important piece of the context. So what you don't want to do is just go sell your company and then start volunteering at nonprofits or move to Africa and try to, you know, be a missionary or something. You've got to stop and think about how can somebody with this skill and this interest and this mission statement in life and with this many hours and this much money to contribute – what is the kind of organizational construct and the role where they can make their most lean, meaningful and highly leveraged contribution? Now, the best way to test that out is on paper first, is sit down and create scenarios. At the Halftime Institute, over the course of the year together, we have this privilege of seeing people get a, a high degree of clarity about their calling, start to create margin, and then they're overwhelmed with opportunities. People just call them. They were invited to be on every board, to go on every <laughs> trip, right? They get business deals coming their way. And um, the more opportunities, the more the confusion escalates. So w the best thing you can do is create scenarios. So let's use mine as an example. My mission is to be a thought leader, because that's my strength, mobilizing high-capacity marketplace leaders to make a, an eternal impact with their life, to not just live a more fulfilling life, but actually impact other people's lives. You know, I'm just not interested in helping a whole bunch of wealthy business owners live a slightly more fulfilling life for the next 30 years <laughs> than golfing somewhere. Slightly mediocrity or mediocrity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what I want to do is help the best and the brightest in corporate leaders and business owners find out what they were created to do and make a really rich, meaningful contribution in this world. So that's my mission. So here's the scenarios. Think about it this way. I could live out that mission by being a motivational speaker. So I do lots of talks like YPO, Young Presidents Organization, and you know, universities, like I spoke at Harvard recently for 90 business owners that are selling their company. It was a symposium for business owners on how to sell your company. I could be a motivational speaker. Number two, I could be a coach. And that would be rich and fulfilling and very relational. It actually fits my strengths because I'm a thought leader. Um, but it's not particularly leveraged. You can only work one, one at a time. Or I could be an author. And so I've written some books and halftime, uh, the, the From Success to Significance book. I've written a book called The Second Half, which is a coffee table book of, of 25 other couples and what they're doing in their second half. And I've wrote the book, Halftime for Couples. And that can be scaled, right? That can impact lots and lots of people. Those are three different scenarios. So when you sit down with your personal board of directors or some close buddies and you talk it through, you know, here I am, I'm a real estate developer. I'm 45 years old. I want my second half to really count. I don't want to just sell the company, move to Naples, Florida, and golf the rest of my life. <laughs> and uh, so here's what my mission is, to be a thought leader, mobilizing high-capacity marketplace leaders to make a, a big impact in other people's lives. And I've come up with these scenarios. I could be a speaker. I could be a coach. I could be a uh, an author. What do you guys think? And all of a sudden, you've got a really meaningful conversation. Now, they said to me, you know, Lloyd, you're introverted. And which is the truth. I gain energy being alone. And even though I'm I'm a good speaker and I'm, I'm comfortable up on stage, when left to myself, I gain energy being alone. And they said, you just can't do that all the, all the time. You couldn't spend every day out in, with groups of people. So, but you're, you're really good one-on-one -on -one, and I think you could become a good author. So what happened is coming through that process of scripting out on paper some scenarios, it saved me lots of time. When I first did that prison deal and I started mentoring prisoners, I spent six months mentoring prisoners. And on the third day, I knew I was terrible at it. <laughs> it would have been way wiser to create those scenarios on paper, right? 
So then the third step is you, you do low cost probes. You don't do high cost experiments like a six month mentoring deal. You, you do something for a short period of time intensively enough that you can you really feel what it's like, but don't disrupt your normal work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and one, one thing that you did a very good job at, and I, and I, I, I think it's another challenge of, of, um, owners and entrepreneurs are looking towards the second half is you become very good at what you're doing, right? So you were a very good real estate developer and you knew how to find the deals. I'm assuming how to assemble the team, how to make that uh, profit and how to squeeze the margin out of the, out of the rent. Like, you're comfortable, right? And you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable again, right? It's that curve that uh, Dean and I talked about where, you know, when you're going out and doing those things, you're not going to be the best at it again. And, you know, when you're used to being the best for the last couple of decades and you have to go to not being that anymore, how, how did you handle that? Well, you know, I, I didn't particularly handle it well because no one had explained it to me like you just did, that when you reinvent yourself at midlife, you're going to go through a detox process. That's a good way to put it. I like it. <laughs> you're going to you're addicted to adrenaline that comes from deals, right? You're addicted to the identity that comes from being the whatever you've been successful at. And when you step into a new role, let's say that you want to mentor. I, I, I'm coaching a guy right now that um, has been a very successful CFO for a large um, privately owned real estate development firm. And he wants to to help poor inner city kids in his city with financial literacy. So he shows up and he went to the class the first day and it was out of control. Now his son, who's 26 or 27, has taught in Teach for America for two years. Yep. And so he said to his son, could you come with me? <laughs> I need some help, right? <laughs> his son had the class figured out in 13 seconds, you know, and he's just a master at it. He said, so he's got his son teaching him. Think about that. His yeah. son's teaching him how to help these kids with financial literacy. What a cool and dynamic. And that's a humbling process, isn't it? Yeah, and what a cool dynamic and being being okay with that too. You know, it's it's – so I think, you know, as you start to put all these different pillars together too, where you have to know who you are, where you want to spend it. And I think, again, uh, Dean and I chatted about it a little bit where you don't have to go hand out lunches and you said you don't have to become a missionary and using your skill sets where like, so I, my old industry was the IT industry. Like if you're super good at technology, can you build a platform for a nonprofit? I mean, so you're still using your skill sets. You don't feel like you're wasting them, right? And um, are you familiar with the term flow? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I, I was bringing it up because I love it. Cause I mean, it's me hiking checks me eyes, perfect definition of happiness, right? And it's the perfect tension between challenges and your skill sets, right? And so when you're reinventing yourself, you go into the quadrant of anxiety because your challenges are, are bigger and greater than your skill sets and how you're figuring that out. So is there anything as your, as owners are trying to go about the second half and they're doing things like that? Any, thing that you've seen that's worked that how they can address that yeah well what we bake into the halftime institute are two kind of parallel things one is you've got to understand that there's a head journey and a heart journey in midlife renewal and the head journey is figuring out what am i going to go do with my time and most of the common mistakes there are so common that with good good help and coaching, you can avoid them. Like, for example, uh, Ryan, one of the common mistakes is that even the most talented executive jumps to the solution too quickly. <laughs> they just all do it because the pain level is high. But the heart journey is the part that you that you really have to have in your mind that along the way, as you reinvent yourself, you are allowing your heart to change. You're really maturing. You're growing beyond an identity that's wrapped up in being a IT company owner or a real estate developer. If, if the only thing that defines who I am is what I do, isn't that kind of pathetic and immature? So my identity can be reshaped in this process 
and it's very freeing, but it's not easy. So when you had people at, cause I think that you, you addressed it and I even went through it and at my younger age, we're like, what do you do after you sell? You're just like, <laughs> and you know, so when someone said, what do you do? You know, they're in turn asking, who are you? Cause they're trying to yeah. take all these assumptions and, you know, generalize you to kind of, you know, assess right. you like, how are you, did you immediately switch to a thought leader or a prison therapist or what yeah. was it? Yeah. And, you know, thankfully I didn't ever say prison thing because I was so terrible <laughs> at that. But, you know, what I did start doing was I would say, well, my, I used to be a real estate developer and I own such and such a building if they knew, if they knew it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, just think about that. That's, that's pathetic. I used to, I used to, yeah. I said it for like yeah. a year and a half and my dad, my dad did too for like a couple of years. Like, so what do you do? Well, we used to own an imaging path and you're like, who cares? What? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the funniest story about that journey was I was coaching a guy that was a senior executive at United Healthcare. And uh, he wanted to mentor young kids downtown LA. So uh, I asked him to go find one and spend a day with him. And he called me back 10 days later. And I said, how'd it go? And he his first comment was, you know, the kid had never heard of United Healthcare. I bet you that was super refreshing. <laughs> He, he he's like my business card carried no weight, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's the part you know. And so then you got to reshape. It, part of the heart journey is to reshape your performance standards. What what makes a good day? If you invested, if this guy invested the whole day mentoring one little Hispanic kid downtown LA, and the kid got a sense of who he really was, and as a result, it changed his self confidence, and he got in. He stayed in high school or something, you know. Is that worthwhile versus running a $17 billion piece of United Healthcare's business? Um, even just learning the value of interdependence, you know, these are important heart journey transitions that happen at midlife. And they're, if you look at the people that are thriving at the end of life, it's not just because they made a whole bunch of money. It's because they were, they let their heart and life get transformed in the process. And so, the idea of finishing great is is rooted in not just figuring out what you're going to do with the second half of your life after you sell the company, but who you're going to be. Yep. And, you know, when you say finishing great, finishing big is one of my favorite books with Bo Burlingham. I think you're familiar with him. And um, what, I, it, what I realized after we had sold, because it was – there was a lot of reasons why we ended up selling, but we had not gone through – your three-step process. We had not done any self-maintenance prior to that. Me, me just particular because of my age, but my dad, because he was living and breathing the business for 20 plus years. And it, it's this uh, theory of margin and the platform of using your company. Because I think there's a lot of push for every, all these business owners to sell their company and to quickly do it. All the advisors make their money off of the transaction. So no one's actually giving them this kind of advice. And it's getting the margin to give yourself freedom and time to look at your heart, right? I mean, is there is there other things as they're looking at the platform of their business and the cash flow and the community and how do, how do they deal with that kind of overlap? Yeah, so usually you want to begin reinventing yourself long before you sell the company, you know, a couple of years before, at least a year before you sell the company. And the reason is because you have to go down into this tunnel of confusion before – you actually come to some degree of clarity about what you want to do next. And you can't decide about whether you need the company or not until you have some clarity about what you want to do next. And so many guys come out the other end of a business sale and they realize I just gave up the platform I needed. <laughs> yep. Well, and think about just a personal experience. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear how you're using your uh, real estate platform to do this. Like, so I'm on a nonprofit board right now. And, you know, we do uh, fundraising and I'll tell you what, it's a heck of a lot harder when you don't have a bunch of vendors that you can say, hey, by the way, I'm not buying the next couple million dollars worth of parts and inventory if you don't give me a check. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. versus you got no leverage, you got no community of people that can help leverage whatever cause it is. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of the first deal is to get really clear on what your calling is and what you're you're going to do next before you decide to sell the company. And then think through about how to use the company. If it fits, 
how to creatively use the company to make the kinds of impact you want. So sometimes it's very practical in, in that your company delivers a certain product and you can do it in ways that will um, really advance you know, a, a fight against human suffering. So for example, my daughter, Jenny, works for Water Mission in Charleston, South Carolina. And they are an engineering firm that delivers clean water, sanitation, hygiene to poor communities around the world in a way that um, enables them to keep their respect. They actually own the facilities, but they're largely funded by U.S. generosity, and they make a little bit of money to keep them maintained. Just a really sustainable model for clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. And well, the, the big water containers for these filters are sold to them by a big company that uh, is privately owned that does it at cost. Mm. And, you know, that's a very compassionate cause coming right out of the business that you can't do if you don't own that business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then there, there are other more less obvious ways that you can use your business. For example, Tana Green um, was – abused when she got married when she was 16 she became she became pregnant and got married at 16 her husband beat her up from 16 to 20 and then she left well as you can imagine when she got to midlife she'd built a company 2500 employees but uh, she's passionate about domestic violence well now she's got i think she said 4000 employees and they're almost all minimum wage you can guarantee that some of them are being abused in domestic violence, and even some of them may be perpetrating domestic violence and need help. So she's got a platform right there with the passion she has and a voice of credibility into their world. And because she's the CEO of a big company, she's the chairwoman of the domestic violence center in her city, and she brings all those leadership skills. Okay. If she didn't have the company, she couldn't impact either of those. I mean, she wouldn't have the credibility to be the chairwoman of this big board, she wouldn't have the money to put into that ministry, and she wouldn't have the 4,000 employees that she could speak to with a very firm but compassionate voice. I love it. So you got to think that through. What I do now with the guys that come through the fellows program at the Halftime Institute is I sit down with their management team, and I give them each of the people in their management team three Post-it notes, and I say to them, I want you to assume you own this whole company. And you can make three meaningful contributions in people's lives around human life without negatively affecting the bottom line of the company. Hmm. Write down what they would be. What do you care about? So they're busy writing them down. And then I go to the whiteboard and put nine boxes up. So along the vertical axis, I put three, uh, three, three labels. First of all, your employees and their families. And then above that, the, the company suppliers and customers, and above that, the communities that you work in. And then across the horizontal axis, I put three, three labels. First is physical needs. The second one moving to the right is emotional needs. And the third moving to the right is spiritual needs. So now you've got a matrix of nine boxes, right? There, it's, it's everything you could do. That's the full spectrum. So I just asked the management team to come up and stick the post-its um, where they belong. Come up, hmm. tell us what you wrote on your three post-its and put them where they belong on here. And and before long, Ryan, they don't even know, remember that I'm in the room. <laughs> I bet you they just get super into it. I love it. Yeah. It's so freeing for them to think really creatively about how you can use your business platform to make a compassionate impact in this world. I love it. Um, what's your favorite story about it? an owner that has had the choice between to sell or not to sell and how they came out the other side into their second half? Well, you know, probably one of the most touching ones is uh, a guy named Robert Barker that owns the Bob Barker company. They're a major supplier to prisons. Um, they all the orange jumpsuits that you, um, and he, he realized that he had options. They could sell the business. They could, he could just keep the business the way it was or, or keep growing it, but he was, you know, in midlife and wondering, but what's the purpose? And he he discovered that, you know, 75% of prisoners leave prison and go back in. It, it's called recidivism. 
can you imagine for every 100 people that leave prison, 70 or 75% go back? Would you want to go back? I mean, why is that? So he started to work on creative solutions around that. And he created a foundation alongside his company. He uses all the management strategy thinking from his management team. He hired a chief innovations officer. They started funneling money over there. And, and they are working on really creative, proactive ways to um, – help people to get out of prison to, to, um, to not go back. That's awesome. And it gives him and his whole management team purpose every day when they show up at work. We're not just selling jumpsuits and we're not just sticking, you know, them on prisoners that are stuck in some prison for 30 years. We're working to build a sustainable system to fight prison recidivism so people don't go back to prison well that's the i mean can you imagine how happy i bet he is every morning when he wakes up and goes to work yeah have you ever and I, and I, we won't go down this rabbit trail but uh have you ever had any of these people that have looked at their corporate structure and turned themselves into a b com a b corp uh which is like tom's shoes where a, por a portion of their proceeds are actually going to a, a charity I haven't seen them turn them into a different structure, but I've seen them become very generous. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll take a portion of the shares of their company and gift them to a found, their foundation or a donor advised fund and create a firewall in between their heart and the money. Yeah, and yeah, I like that. That's because interesting. money has incredible gravitational pull. <laughs> gravitational pull. That's a. I like that. If there's one thing you're to leave our listeners with uh, that we haven't touched on yet, what would it be? Well, I would say don't go on this journey alone. You know, when you're building your company, you get outside help. And you, if you're smart, you get into some kind of a forum group of, of entrepreneurs. And when you've got a problem, you've got a mentor. You know, I had a mentor in our business. And um, so I wouldn't go on this journey alone. And, and what, one of the things that we're – sold on at the Halftime Institute, having done this now, really this is all I've done with my time for the last 17 years. I've spent wow. more than 11,000 hours now coaching no business kidding. owners on this journey. That's mastery. Is, uh, yeah, exactly. So um, it is they, they need a process, of course, um, and but even more importantly, they need to be surrounded by some peers that aren't just trying to drive the next quarter's earnings, but they're trying to really intentionally think through their purpose and how to reinvent themselves. So we we make sure that everything we do at the Halftime Institute, we are surrounded with a cohort group of peers, and you've got expert coaching, you've got a process, it's built around case studies, and you're surrounded by peers. So I wouldn't recommend doing it on your own. I always recommend people that they get a, a surrounded by peers. And you're, when it comes to this idea of making your second half of life the very best, most creative and productive season of your life, you're swimming upstream. This is a culture that every time you look at a retirement ad, people are just goofing off, traveling somewhere, mm -hmm. golfing, stuff that would be significantly meaningful for the first few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right, if that. <laughs> you know, so you're swimming upstream. You need to be surrounded by people that don't think you're crazy, that you want to make a really meaningful, lasting contribution. I think that's huge because um, I've said it in other interviews and – you know, when you're an owner and you've got you're writing the payroll checks and you're holding the 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 risk with the bank, I mean, no one really gets that and you end up feeling alone, right? So to say to someone, I feel empty for some reason or I feel like there's something else, knowing that there's other people out there that can actually help guide you is super important. And then, you know, your book about having this journey around couples too is pretty significant because you know, I, I don't think that it's possible if you've got a spouse to do it without each other because, again, to come home one day and uh, Dean said that his, his wife immediately thought of it as risk for her, you yeah. know, and making sure that, you know, you're having open dialogue with everybody around it. Any final words on that? Yeah, well, you know, I didn't see that to start with. And I said to Linda, you know, I think we've got what we need to live on. And, and if we live simply, we can live on what we have the rest of our life. And her first reaction was, well, how simple is simple? <laughs> and um, 
I told her, you know, I was looking for more meaning and significance in, in my life. And she said, well, you need to know I'm drowning in significance, <laughs> you know, like with your wife with two kid, two twins. And um, so you're right. So what we did was we wrote this 90 minute read ebook that's actually free called Halftime for Couples. And the reason we did it so that it's a 90 minute read and so it's it's an ebook is so that, you know, at the end of a show like this, people have instant access to something that really will help them and what we did was we just studied couples who did this well who thought through how to live life after you sell the company and like you said life after your company is got to be intertwined with your spouse if you want it to be fulfilling and if you happen to be married so yeah halftime for couples is a great read it's not our advice it's not our wisdom it's the composite of the journey of many people that we've had the privilege of knowing and observing and, and interviewing so you can just get it at halftime.org slash couples and uh and it's a it's a great tool just to get you started on nice. the right foot. and i'll put it in the show notes too for everybody um lloyd if there's a good way for listeners to get in touch with you yeah, best way is Lloyd.reeb at halftime.org. And obviously, halftime.org is the website where you can find out about what's happening near you. And you know that I do about 80 talks a year. So chances are I'm doing a talk in your city. I love it. Lloyd, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan.